Your show will go live in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back, Attorney. St- well, we- <laughs> I guess we got to wait for the intro music. enough of that. All right, how's everybody doing today? Happy Sunday, Sunday, fun day, as we like to call it. Today, Attorney Steve Vondren here. Today, we are talking about XRP, Ripple, SEC, MSJ, motion for summary judgment. Okay, so um, general intro intro here. Um, So we're talking cryptocurrency I've never seen so much enthusiasm over a uh, token called XRP. Um, There's so much stuff online, and it's a big, long history. And and many people think uh, this may be the crypto case of the decade, and I agree, it might be. Um, I think we may find some clarification on what's going on with SEC and Ripple, the future of cryptocurrency, will there be regulations, are selling crypto coins and tokens, is this a security? Um, all kinds of things. So um, if you are a, what they call XRP army, you will probably find some interesting things here. Maybe perhaps you were not aware of. So I'm gonna walk you through uh, where they're at in the lawsuit. And let me just read this kind of, kind of as a general intro for you. On December 22nd, 2020, The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, filed a complaint against Ripple Labs, Inc. and two of its executives, alleging that they had raised over $1.3 billion uh, through an unregistered securities offering. The SEC's complaint alleges that Ripple's sales of digital tokens, known as XRP, constituted an investment contract under U.S. securities law. And we're going to talk about the Howey test, okay? If you're in the crypto game, you know about the Howey test. If you're, you know, if you're, if you're not, it probably won't make much sense, but this is a good time to learn for you. Um, that it constituted an investment contract under U.S. securities laws and that Ripple violated these laws by failing to register the offering with the SEC. In its motion for summary judgment, the SEC argues that there is no genuine issue of fact or dispute of fact that Ripple's XRP tokens are securities and that Ripple is therefore liable for violating the securities laws. Hearing on the motion probably will be coming up sometimes um, by the end of the year, I would say. So what a MSJ is, motion for summary judgment. So both parties get to the point where they say, look, we've done our discovery. We've done our fact finding. And this is a matter of law. The judge needs to decide it. And both parties have filed their own MSJ, you know, cross motions for summary judgment. And so the judge is going to go through all the all the paper. And believe me, it, this is voluminous. Um, this video will take some time, but I did promise my viewers, my, um, YouTube and other viewers that I would be going through this. There's a lot of confusion. People ask me, well, what's going on? You know, all kinds of things. So, um, but the judge will have to decide, is there a tribal issue of fact that needs to go to the jury? Now I, you know, after you hear everything that I'm going to read, you're probably going to go, whoa, whoa, what jury would want to sit and hear all this and how would they ever make sense of it? So um, I, I tend to believe, as many others, that it will be decided, this issue, is it a security? Is XRP a security? I believe it will be decided on motion for summary judgment. That's my opinion. This is general legal information only. This is not financial advice. This is not legal advice. This is nothing. I am reading 
an MSJ for you. If you have any friends, uh, my TikTok friends out there, if you have any friends that are big in crypto, um, forward them this feed. You know, this is going to be a great one to listen to. I'm gonna, you're going to hear things I'm sure you've never heard. I'm just positive. So what I'm going to do is today I'm going to read the SEC's motion for summary judgment. And tomorrow I will read the defendant's um, motion for summary judgment. So the best way to, to uh, view things, especially as an intelligent person, is you want to hear both sides. Everybody knows there's two sides to a story. So hear this one, and again, it's long, but if you're a buff and you're really into crypto and XRP, into this space, blockchain and all that, metaverse, NFTs, you know, it's good for you to know because this is really a really good look at, to the thought process of the SEC, what they're looking at. So you can hear some of the key language. Cameron, what's up, my buddy? Yeah, what's up there, dog? I uh, hope you're doing well today. We're talking XRP, babies. So um, we're talking about MSJs, and that's something I hope you're learning out there at your wonderful top law school my my wonderful protege, shall I say. Uh, but awesome to see you, buddy. Hope things are going well. Um, so yeah, so the judge is going to have to decide the two MSJs, which one, do, do they think there's a tribal issue of fact. So let's not belabor it any longer. Um, that's kind of my intro. But if you're really into it, listen to both sides and then make your own decision. You know, the laws in here, you can read the laws and the facts that they have and everything else, and you can make your own decision. All right. So without further ado, let's go into the XRP. Um, this is the SEC. Okay. This is the SEC filing their motion for summary judgment, telling the judges no tribal issue of fact. This is an investment contract. Okay. This is an investment contract. They were selling a security. Boom. Hit, hit them with whatever they were looking for. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go to the intro. There's a really nice... Um, there's a really nice table of contents that a lot of time was put into this, I can tell you. Uh, but let's get down, if we can get to the facts, there's a bunch of pages just with the table of contents, table of authorities. Cameron, you got to make sure you get those table of authorities, your statutes, and your authorities and things like that. All right, let's go into it. Plaintiff Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC. And by the way, guys, there's a ton of quotes in here, like, you know, quotes, quotes, where they have you know, evidence or alleged evidence as to these quotes. I'm not going to say quote, unquote, quote, unquote. I'd be here all day trying to do that, okay? So I'm not going to do that. I will post this um, case on my, let's see, I'll post it on my, I'll, I'll post it in the comments section of my different platforms. So make sure if you really want to read it now, you would, if this would make great not, reading at night, you'll probably fall asleep in about five minutes. But let's get into it. I love this stuff. Plaintiff Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, respectfully submits his memorandum of law in support of its motion for summary judgment on the SEC's claims that defendant Ripple Labs, Inc., Ripple, Christian A. Larson, Larson and Bradley Garlinghouse, Garlinghouse, together with the Larson, the individual defendants, violated Section 5 of the Securities Act of 1933, Securities Act, and that the individual defendants aided and abetted Ripple's violations. The court should grant SEC's motion. Preliminary statement, Congress enacted Section 5, a strict liability statute. Strict liability just means you're liable whether you intended to do it or not. To ensure that companies issuing securities and their officers, issuers, among others, disclose certain information when offering or selling securities to the public. This ensures that investors can make informed decisions about whether to invest in particular securities, a bedrock disclosure principle underlying U.S. capital markets. Section 5, therefore, requires that before directly or indirectly offering or selling securities to the public, issuers and their officers file with the SEC a publicly available registration statement that includes information about the issuer's financial condition and the securities investment risks 
unless a valid exemption from registration exists. The undisputed facts here, including defendants' own statements to the investing public, show that defendants violated Section 5 by offering and selling digital tokens to the public as securities. At the outset, Ripple's founders created and allocated amongst themselves and Ripple 100 billion billion units of a digital token called XRP through computer programming. Defendants then offered and sold over 2 billion worth of XRP to the public and used those proceeds to fund Ripple's business. Defendants concede they filed no registration statement for these offers and sales. The main issue before the court is thus, whether defendants offered and sold XRP as securities under the Securities Act, the term security includes, quote unquote, investment contracts. It's kind of the main issue in the case. Over 75 years ago in SEC versus W.J. Howey Co., it's a 1946 case, and this is what we call the Howey test, the Howey case, okay? Um, that's what's at issue in this case. The Supreme Court held that an investment contract is an investment in a common venture premised on a reasonable expectation of profits to be derived from the efforts of others, okay? I'm going to read it one more time. This is key to understand, okay? That's what we're talking about. Investment in a common venture premised on a reasonable expectation of profits to be derived from the efforts of others. The Howey test asks whether the transaction involves all the elements of a profit-seeking business venture. To answer that question, how he requires courts to look at the economic reality of a transaction, not the labels issuers place on it. Courts routinely grant the SEC summary judgment in cases applying the Howey test, whereas here, the undisputed evidence shows that defendants' offers and sales of XRP were offers and sales of investment contracts under Howey. The court should grant the SEC summary judgment on its Section 5 claims. First, so now they're giving some of their rationale and reasoning. First, the undisputed facts show that as a matter of economic reality, a purchase of XRP is an investment in a common enterprise with other XRP holders and with Ripple. All units of XRP are fungible, meaning they're equally interchangeable with each other, and the price of all units of XRP rise or fall equally. Moreover, starting in 2013, Ripple and its first CEO, Defendant Larson, funded the business by pooling and using the $1.5 billion in cash proceeds from the unregistered sales of XRP which constituted nearly 90% of Ripple's funding sources during the relevant period. And as defendants said when marketing XRP to purchasers, defendants' interests are aligned with those of XRP investors. As Ripple CEO defendant Garlinghouse, that's Brad Garlinghouse, stated, Ripple owns a lot of XRP and therefore Anything we do that's good for that digital asset is good for us. Company talking points instructed Ripple employees to say, consistent with statements on Ripple's website, Ripple makes money through XRP sales and uses it to grow its team and its business. Second, defendants led investors to expect a profit from buying XRP. Ripple directed investment inquiries into how to buy XRP web pages, specifically targeted speculators when offering and selling XRP, and promoted XRP price rallies. 
and investors' ability to buy and sell XRP on online marketplaces known as exchanges or trading platforms. Garlinghouse touted XRP's 20,000% increase in value and noted that Ripple was just getting started in investing in efforts for XRP. Defendants also repeatedly marketed and undertook efforts to create, support, and protect the liquidity of the XRP trading market, the existence of which was critical for Ripple and XRP investors to profit from their XRP holdings. Third, Ripple publicly tied the potential for profit to its promised entrepreneurial and managerial efforts. As Ripple put it, it was going to try to find a use for XRP, given that none existed when it was created, and to create an ecosystem around Ripple's technology, essentially an infrastructure of digital products and services dependent on XRP. Ripple did so in the hopes that it would increase the demand and therefore the value of XRP. Ripple then mounted a marketing campaign that made explicit to the investing public the economic reality of being XRP's largest stakeholder, that Ripple had significant and unique financial and reputational incentives to pursue a use for and to be good stewards for XRP. Larson explained Ripple would monetize its XRP and invest it back into the ecosystem, which would be good for everybody. Garlinghouse noted that investors were connecting the dots between Ripple's efforts and XRP's price and explained that the existence of the central figure, Ripple, making efforts to increase XRP's value distinguished XRP from other digital assets for which no such figure existed and that when the price of XRP went up 200%, XRP's market cap increased dramatically, which signaled market expectations of Ripple. Garlinghouse also publicized his view that Ripple's price, referring to XRP, was going up because of the work we have done. David Schwartz, one of XRP's most prominent creators, publicly explained that Rickle, <laughs> Ripple had economic incentives to spend $100 million to make the price of XRP go up by 0.01 because Ripple would then be massively profit. Defendants cannot dispute the content of their many public statements about Ripple and XRP, including the sampling described above, nor can def defendants dispute either the vast record of the efforts they made consistent with those representations or the economic reality. Ripple funded its business by touting XRP's profit potential, selling and distributing XRP to public investors, while keeping a large amount of XRP for itself and consistent with Ripple's financial incentives, becoming the creator, architect, developer, builder, and caretaker of XRP's common enterprise. The SEC is also entitled to summary judgment on its aiding and abetting claim against the individual defendants. Based on the undisputed facts, Ripple violated Section 5, as described above. Larson and Garlinghouse had a general awareness of their overall role in Ripple's illegal scheme. Uh, they substantially assisted Ripple's scheme through their own actions as Ripple CEOs and with their own offers and sales through which they profited by another $600 million. Finally, the SEC is entitled to summary judgment in, in its favor on defendants' affirmative defense that they lacked fair notice, that their conduct could violate the law, and on the individual defendants' related due process defense. Howey, that's the Howey case, provides security sellers with the notice that is constitutionally required. The SEC explicitly warned issuers of digital assets to comply with the securities laws and defendants had actual notice that their conduct risk violating the securities laws, as the undisputed facts show here. Indeed, 
the alleged regulatory uncertainty defendants have claimed in this litigation is belied by Garlinghouse's contemporaneous observation. Regulatory uncertainty is just a euphemism for we wish we could ignore SEC regulations. Defendants made a calculated decision to risk an SEC or private lawsuit. And by the way, there is a separate private lawsuit um, against Ripple that uh, I won't go into here, but this, so they risked a private lawsuit or an SEC lawsuit in order to profit by over $2 billion and cannot now feign surprise that their day in court has come. All right, so that's just the general intro. Now I'm going to get into the background. The background's going to have some more facts, uh, more detailed facts. I'm going to fill up my water real quick. Get your popcorn. Get your popcorn ready. If you're out in Virginia, you know, put aside those law books for a moment. This is very important for your legal education. All right, Attorney Steve, I'm back. Fresh glass of water. And uh, we're here talking about the SEC versus Ripple motion for summary judgment. Any of my TikToker fans out there, if you've got any crypto people, any of you, your friends, I love crypto, I love XRP, I love Ripple to the moon. Send them this feed, get them on, do them a favor because I'm reading kind of the allegations. A lot of this stuff, I guarantee you, people that are talking about Ripple and XRP, they probably don't know. I mean, because this is, I mean, this is pretty much brand new stuff. And, you know, so let's continue. Let's go into the background, okay? This, again, this is the SEC's motion for summary judgment. Sections 5A and 5C of the Securities Act require the offer or sale of securities to the public to be accompanied by the full and fair disclosure afforded by registration statement filed with the SEC. Registration requires disclosure of information about the value of securities, the issuer's financial condition, and investment risks. Like if you're investing your money, don't you kind of want to know what it is? Um, Anyway, let's move on. Congress enacted this registration requirement to ensure that potential securities purchasers have the information they need to make informed investment decisions. And it is central to the Securities Act's comprehensive scheme for protecting public investors. Now, here we go. A security includes an investment contract, which means... An investment of money, remember we talked about this, an investment of money in a common enterprise with a reasonable expectation of profits to be derived from the entrepreneurial or managerial efforts of others, okay? The efforts of others. The Howey test is designed to be flexible and capable of adaptation to meet the countless and variable schemes devised by those who seek the use of money of others on the promise of profits. Congress sought to define the term security in sufficiently broad and general terms so as to include within that definition the many types of instruments that in our commercial world fall within the ordinary concept of a security. Howie is an objective test. Courts evaluate the entirety of the party's understandings and expectations. To determine whether, in light of the economic reality and the totality of circumstances, an investment contract existed. The facts routinely support a finding that the Howey test has been met, and accordingly, courts routinely grant summary judgment to the SEC on Section 5 claims, including in determining whether something is a security. All right. The Dow report and SEC enforcement actions involving crypto assets. On July 25th, 2017, the Dow, regarding the issuer of a decentralized digital token that sold the token to the public investors to fund its business operations. 
The report analyzed the offer and sale of DAO tokens, DAO, and concluded they were offered and sold as investment contracts based on Howey and later cases. The report advised those who would use distributed ledger or blockchain enable means for capital raising to take appropriate steps to ensure compliance with the U.S. federal securities laws. The SEC explained, whether or not a particular transaction involves the offer and sale of a security, regardless of the terminology used, will depend on the facts and circumstances, including the economic realities of the transaction. Those who offer and sell securities in the United States must comply with the federal securities laws, including the requirement to register with the commission. These requirements apply to those who offer and sell securities in the United States, regardless whether the issuing entity is a traditional company or a decentralized autonomous organization. That's your DAO, D-A-O. The DAO report is part of the guidance issued by the SEC as to the scope of its regulatory authority and enforcement power in the crypto space. Between September 2017 and December 2020, the SEC filed 35 actions alleging that unregistered offers and sales of digital assets violated Section 5. And in April 2019, SEC staff issued additional guidance as to the application of Howey to offers and sales of digital assets. So there's a link to that on the SEC website. The SEC's message has been clear. Those who sell digital assets to publicly raise capital must ensure their actions comply with the federal securities laws. Background. Before co-founding Ripple, Larson was the CEO of a company the, C the SEC sued for violating Section 5. As set forth more fully below in 2012, Larson formed Ripple with other individuals who created a finite supply of 100 billion units of a digital asset they initially called Ripple Credits or Ripples and subsequently called XRP. Ripple and Larson were warned by a law firm that selling this asset could run afoul of the Securities Act. But Ripple would eventually need to spend over $2 billion to fund its ambitious business projects. And Ripple's business projects also depended on the existence of a robust liquid trading market for XRP. And Ripple's, um, uh, thus, Ripple, Ripple's publicly stated business mission and its financial health compelled it to sell or otherwise distribute XRP to raise capital. Ripple's founders created XRP and XRP Ledger. In 2012, Jed McAlib, Arthur Brito, and David Schwartz programmed a cryptographically secured ledger or blockchain that they called the Ripple Network or Ripple Protocol, now the XRP Ledger, which records transactions and exists across a network of computers. They also created a fixed supply of 100 billion units of a native token, which they called Ripple Credits, or ripples, and today are called XRP. Each unit of XRP is divisible into 1 million drops. 0 0.000001 XRP is one drop, and each unit and drop of XRP are indistinguishable from and fungible with any other unit or drop. XRP serves a de minimis technical function on the XRP ledger. To transfer XRP on the ledger, one must burn, i.e. delete, 10 or 20 one millionths of XRP. 
In September 2012, McCallop, Brito, and Larson founded Ripple's corporate predecessor, NewCoin, or OpenCoin, and Larson became its CEO. The three founders retained $20 billion XRP, including $9 billion for Larson, and Ripple received the remaining $80 billion. Schwartz became chief cryptographer. Defendants received warnings that XRP offers and sales could be investment contracts under Howey. In 2012, before the network of computers on which XRP exists was launched publicly, Ripple and Larson received two memos from the law firm Perkins Coie. Now, that's a pretty giant law firm, guys. Um, Ripple and Larson received two memos from the law firm Perkins Coie about the legal risks surrounding XRP. The legal memos analyzed Ripple credits under Howey to determine if their offers and sales could be security transactions. The February memo advised that if sold to investors, Ripple credits are likely to be securities. Tokens not initially sold may still constitute securities if sold at a later date. And if these tokens are purchased with an expectation of profit because of the efforts of persons promoting the tokens, there is a risk that the tokens will constitute investment contracts. Perkins Coe recommended do not sell the tokens. The October 2012 memo similarly noted, although we believe that a compelling argument can be made that Ripple credits do not constitute securities, we believe that there is some risk, albeit small, that the SEC disagrees with our analysis. The more that founders and company promote Ripple credits as an investment opportunity, the more likely it is that the SEC will take action and argue that Ripple credits are investment contracts and thus securities. To the extent that Ripple credits are purchased with an expectation of profit because of the efforts of the company, there is a risk that Ripple credits will constitute investment contracts. So this is what knowledge they had. And again, it it seemed to focus, um, I want to say this one more time in there, the more that founders and company promote Ripple credits as an investment opportunity, they use the word promote, the more likely it is. So I want you to just bear that in mind. Perkins Coe advised, steer clear of promoting Ripple credits as an investment opportunity or as a speculative investment trading vehicle. Perkins Coe warned that the risk of XRP meeting the Howey test was higher because there will be a specific entity, Ripple, which is responsible for the distribution of Ripple credits and marketing functions of the Ripple network. Under a bold heading, ways to diminish the risk that Ripple credits are deemed to be securities, Perkins Coe advised, obtaining a no action letter from the SEC would provide further comfort that Ripple credits are not securities. Larson reviewed and discussed the legal memos with Perkins Coe. In May 2014, Larson wrote that investors and employees could not receive XRP as it could risk SEC designation as a security and that Ripple's founders assumed risk of being issuers and received comp for personally assuming this risk. Larson was Ripple's SEC, excuse me, Larson was Ripple's CEO until the end of 2016. Since 2013, he has also been the chairman of Ripple's board and has at all times had a controlling stake in the company. Defendant Garlinghouse joined Ripple as its chief operating officer in 2015 and became its second CEO on January 1st, 
2017, a position he holds to this day. As set forth below, from the outset of his tenure, Garlinghouse received multiple warnings that XRP had securities types characteristics and that how he talks about XRP matters in terms of determining whether it was a security under the Howey test. So you're kind of getting it how this is all working. Um, next, Ripple needed to monetize its large XRP stake to fund, fund its ambitious business plans of finding a use for XRP. Ripple described its business goals ambitiously. Patrick Griffin, an early Ripple employee who managed its XRP sales, explained the goal as directing all sorts of digital payment types to occur on the XRP ledger. Ripple's business model was predicated on a belief that demand for XRP will rise, resulting in price appreciation if the Ripple protocol becomes the backbone for global value transfer, which Ripple would achieve by leveraging its talented individuals with experience in relevant technology companies. A related goal was to develop uses for XRP, such as a bridge asset, one that affects a trade between two other assets, because making efforts to find uses for XRP could make it gain value, which would be accredited to the asset holdings of Ripple. In Larson's words, these ambitions were extremely expensive. And as Garlinghouse put it, Ripple's vision for XRP was ambitious, as Ripple was trying to solve a multi-trillion dollar problem. Ashish Birla, Ripple's head of product development, noted that developing products for financial institutions is very resource intensive. Thus, Ripple would need to spend a billion dollars to succeed. Strip down XRP is just computer code. When it was created, XRP had no market, no price, and no use. Ripple could not monetize its XRP or, use, or find any use for it as a bridge asset without a trading market, which requires market participants, marketplaces, liquidity, and trading interest. Market participants buying and selling or speculating in XRP were thus a precondition to Ripple's goals of monetizing it, as were crypto exchanges described as a pillar of Ripple's XRP strategy. Thus, Ripple's twin goals, monetizing XRP while finding uses for it, required it to create a speculative trading market by incentivizing speculators and trading platforms. In 2013, Griffin and Phil Rappaport, another early Ripple employee whose responsibilities included the XRP markets, created a presentation reflecting the various ways in which Ripple would distribute XRP with the goal of creating a market for XRP such that a use could develop and Ripple could monetize XRP. So how are you guys liking this so far? Are you getting it? You got any thumbs up? Hit that like button. Anybody like what you're hearing? I'm going to keep going. I've got to get some water here. All right. Back to the show. Ripple and Larson create the XRP trading markets. From the start, Ripple offered XRP as an investment in Ripple's ambitious upcoming efforts and expertise. In 2013 and 2014, Ripple created three documents, a Ripple for Gateway sales brochure, a Ripple primer, and a deep dive for financial professionals, which it distributed publicly, including to prospective and existing XRP investors. These documents explain Ripple's increase in value thesis. Ripple's efforts to find use for XRP could increase demand for XRP and therefore its value. For example, the Gateways brochure 
which Ripple distributed to at least 100 people starting around May 2013, explained that XRP is valued by its usefulness to internet commerce and that Ripple's business plan is based on the success of XRP, which um, will sell wholesale to fund itself. The sales brochure touted XRP's profit potential by graphically representing the increased price of Bitcoin and XRP and stating this proved there was value in crypto. The primer which Rappaport created and sent to Larson in draft form was aimed at generating interest from financial institutions and received widespread distribution. It similarly explained that Ripple hoped to make money from XRP if the world finds the Ripple network useful. And that Ripple would retain a portion of XRP with the hope of creating a robust and liquid marketplace in order to monetize its only asset. Ripple provided the primer to two early XRP investors who later became evangelists for XRP. To reach a wide audience, Ripple posted on its website and circled the deep dive for financial professionals, which Rappaport created to answer investor questions. This brochure explained how Ripple would monetize XRP and that if the Ripple protocol becomes widely adopted, demand for XRP may increase, leading to an increase in price. This document and an open coin white paper also explained Ripple would retain 25% of XRP to fund itself and that its business model is based on the success of XRP. Set forth the experience of Ripple's team. Noted that given its promised efforts, Ripple expected demand for XRP to be considerable and concluded that an early increase in XRP's price proves the viability of this model. Ripple gave similar sales pitches directly to potential investors in XRP. Griffin, Schwartz, Rappaport, and other Ripple employees told potential investors that Ripple was taking steps to provide liquidity for the XRP markets and to build the XRP network, and that Ripple would want itself to itself capture any significant increase in the price of XRP it was able to achieve by these efforts. Griffin marketed XRP as a value play or an asset appreciation play, an asset that trades at a price too low. And Rappaport told investors Ripple would distribute XRP to increase demand and strengthen XRP's price. Ripple also began an aggressive marketing campaign. In April 2013, Ripple tweeted about the Ripple price, quoted Larson as saying Ripple would keep 50% of XRP to build team, build team to contribute code, build apps, and promote hashtag Ripple. Posted an interview of Larson explaining Ripple's business plans and touted that an increase in XRP's price meant that Ripple mania has officially arrived. From inception, Schwartz, one of XRP's creators who posts under the pseudonym Joel Katz, explained to crypto asset enthusiasts that Ripple was effectively the central authority to XRP, who was going to develop client and server technology software for as long as necessary because it believed that broad adoption of Ripple as a payment platform would drive demand. Schwartz also said that Ripple was legally obligated to its shareholders to maintain the value and liquidity of XRP, that its financial interest was in seeing the value of XRP increase, that Ripple would do what we can to drive adoption of the XRP ledger or network, and that its adoption would drive demand in XRP. In late 2016, Ripple began promoting XRP by publishing XRP market reports on its website. Okay. 
Ripple seeds a market for XRP and begins selling XRP. Alongside these promotional efforts, Ripple began creating a market for XRP. The first step was to give away XRP to the recipients who could sell them, thus establishing a trading market and a price. The next step was to give XRP to market makers in order to have them trade XRP against other assets and create price quotes. Ripple considered these steps, including loaning XRP to market makers and forgiving the loans once they lost XRP to the market, as establishing the building blocks of an XRP market. Ripple would later describe these efforts as attempts to prime the pump or start the flywheel of the XRP markets. Next, and despite legal warnings not to do so, Ripple began to sell XRP. Ripple began selling XRP over the counter in transactions with in institutional investors, hedge funds, and market makers through its wholly owned subsidiary, XRP2, institutional sales. Did you know there was a wholly owned subsidiary, XRP2? Ripple also began selling XRP directly to the public through market makers on crypto trading platforms and noting that XRP was available to trade on such platforms. The market makers used trading algorithms to sell in amounts prog programmatically set not to exceed a percentage of XRP's daily trading knowledge. Quote, programmatic sales. Defendants marketed a purchase of XRP as an investment into a common enterprise. Notice how they're trying to factually support their elements of the Howey test. Defendants and an XRP investor's financial interests have always been aligned. Ripple relies on XRP to fund itself, and its XRP holdings are its single largest entry on its balance sheets. It is therefore in, Rip, Rip, in Ripple's interest for the price of XRP to rise. Ripple employees acknowledge this economic reality. It is beneficial to Ripple if the price of XRP is higher. As a matter of math and logic, if the price of XRP increased, Ripple's holdings of XRP were more valuable. Over the long term, an increase in price would both benefit XRP holders and Ripple. And if Ripple had a choice, Ripple would prefer the long-term price to go up. An XRP price decline, on the other hand, could be detrimental or damaging for Ripple. Accordingly, when XRP's price did not increase as much as that of other crypto assets, Ripple noticed and considered corrective steps. This economic reality aligned Ripple's interest with those of XRP investors who would want to see the price of XRP increase. And it aligned Ripple and XRP investors' interests with those of Ripple employees who received millions of dollars worth of in XRP as compensation, permitting them to share in the risk of the price of XRP going up or down, or so that they could participate in XRP markets with Ripple. Ripple dispersed over 800 million units of XRP as executive compensation. Ripple employees monitored the XRP markets, including XRP's price, volume, liquidity, and public sentiment on a daily basis. As Griffin, who made some, probably some ungodly amount of money because it's blacked out here, redacted, selling XRP, admitted he was hoping that XRP's trading liquidity volume and price would rise so that he could make money. Defendants repeatedly touted their common interest with XRP purchasers. It is common knowledge that Ripple is XRP's largest holder as Ripple posts its XRP holding on its website. Let me read that again. It is common knowledge that Ripple is XRP's largest holder as Ripple posts its XRP holdings on its website. And Ripple persistently touted the alignment of its interest with XRP investors' interests. The Deep Dive brochure stated that Ripple's interests were aligned 
with those who hold XRP. Garlinghouse explained why the interests were aligned. We are a capitalist. We own a lot of XRP. Other Ripple employees publicly and privately acknowledge Ripple's ambitious plans and their dependence on XRP sales. Company talking points which Ripple employees followed instructed employees to say that Ripple makes money through XRP sales, owns just over 60% of XRP, and uses its team to grow, uses it to grow its team and its business. This was consistent with Ripple's 2015 website post stating Ripple sells XRP to fund its operations, which allows Ripple Labs to have a spectacularly skilled team to pursue its business. Similarly, in October 2019, Garlinghouse stated in a public interview that Ripple owns a lot of XRP and was interested in the health and success of the ecosystem. And anything we do that's good for that digital asset is good for us. The same month, Ripple noted on its websites its interests were aligned with those of XRP holders and that Ripple was a responsible and transparent stakeholder of XRP. Later that month, Garlinghouse publicly stated that Ripple owns a lot of XRP, so we are certainly interested in the success of XRP. Garlinghouse also publicly stated he is very long XRP as a percentage of his personal balance sheet. Schwartz noted that the ideal situation for Ripple would be an increasing XRP price over the long term with few downward spikes to maximize Ripple's proceeds from XRC sales and that both Ripple and XRP holders want more use for the XRP ledger and XRP, more liquidity for XRP, and are interested in price. And that even a small increase in XRP's price would cause Ripple to be massively profit. All right, you guys enjoying this so far? I got to get some more water. You know, it's a, it's a lot of reading here. I'm only on page 16, guys. It's like 75 pages. I'm going to try to get in as much as I can, but I at least want to try to get through their statement of facts so that when I do, when I do um, ripples tomorrow, hopefully you can compare the two, make your own decision and think about if you were the judge, what will you do? I'll be right back. If you have friends into crypto, especially XRP Army, you Bitcoiners, people that love Ethereum, share this feed. They're going to love it. They're going to hear things that I know they're not going to go look up this website, uh, the, uh, the lawsuit. I know they're not going to sit through and read it all. And if they do, probably not going to understand it. So, so invite your friends now. I'll be back in a minute. All right, Attorney Steve is back. We are talking SEC versus Ripple, the motion for summary judgment. Crypto law, baby. Crypto law, blockchain law. Look, I think this stuff is the future. It's got to, my opinion, this is, this is just diverging into my own opinion. It's got to be regulated. There's way too many coins and tokens. And I see so many scams. We get emails all the time of people that are getting scammed left and right. I mean, it's it's literally out of control. Um but anyway, that's, you know, but I am a believer in blockchain, crypto, meta, you know, crypto gaming, things like that. I, you know, I think we're at the very early stages. So, you know, we're in looking at these things and bringing this great info for you. If you like it, give me a heart, give me a thumbs up. It's not going to kill you. Let's proceed. Defendants publicized their efforts to lock up certain XRP holdings as proof of Ripple's stewardship of XRP and common interest with investors. Ripple publicly casts itself as a responsible steward of XRP, as Ripple's talking points instructed Ripple employees to publicly note, we've been strong stewards of XRP and our interests are very much aligned. In other words, Ripple as an XRP owner has similar interests with other XRP holders. Ripple took other specific steps to demonstrate its stewardship 
of XRP. From its inception, Ripple heard public feedback that large sales of XRP by Ripple or its founders, including McCaleb, who received 9 billion units, could depress XRP's price. Ripple described this as overhang that could cause XRP to lose speculator interest. Given the prospect of someone flooding the market or headwinds that would drive the price of XRP down and hinder its adoption. In response, Ripple sought to ensure, uh, assure, excuse me, assure investors that Ripple and investors' interests were in fact aligned. First, to shield XRP holders from a short-term price shock that could result from McCaleb sales, Larson and Ripple announced a Founders XRP lockup plan to assure investors that there would be no dumping event by the other founders. And in approximately July 2014, when McCaleb announced his plan to increase his XRP sales, Ripple negotiated and by August 2014 was able to announce at Larson's direction an agreement requiring McCaleb to slow down his sales to minimize any negative impact on XRP's price. The announcement was meant to assure the market we're resolving the founders XRP responsibly. While pitching an XRP investment to an institutional investor, Ripple explained that the settlement deal with McCaleb meant XRP's price could go up to 50 to 80%. Second, Ripple reminded the public of its financial incentives not to be a bad actor as to XRP. In May 2017, with Garlinghouse's and Larson's approval, Ripple announced it would place 55 billion XRP into an escrow account that would release 1 billion XRP a month and to which Ripple would return any unsold XRP on a monthly basis. The escrow account's purpose was to remind investors of the common enterprise XRP represented, as Larson put it, to drive trust within the XRP community. And in Garlinghouse's words, to remove concerns investors had about Ripple dumping XRP. Garlinghouse promoted the escrow account arrangement as consistent with Ripple's proven track record of being good stewards towards of XRP. And as proving that Ripple's self-interest is aligned with building and maintaining a healthy XRP market. When the escrow account became effective in late 2017, Ripple again marketed it to create a second wave of excitement among speculators. Larson and others at Ripple enthusiastically noted that the announcement generated a price increase in XRP with Larson texting a Ripple employee, they like our XRP lockup. Defendants told investors to view XRP as an investment that could be profitable based on Ripple's promised managerial efforts. From its inception, Ripple cast XRP as an investment. Ripple directed investment inquiries into how to buy XRP or guide to getting XRP web pages as part of its efforts to drum up buyer interest in XRP. Ripple listed on its website crypto trading platforms that traded XRP. In January 2008, Ripple admitted on its website that the top question about Ripple and XRP was, how do I buy XRP? Explained where XRP was available for purchase and explained it was a top priority for Ripple to have XRP listed. Defendants also marketed XRP as an investment in Ripple's efforts to find a use for XRP. Defendants touted XRP as an investment in Ripple's efforts to find an XRP use 
and touted XRP price increases as proof that Ripple was succeeding. Defendants promised they would remain committed to undertaking efforts to find a use for XRP. Ripple publicly touted the various steps it was taking and would, would take to find a use for XRP and to protect the integrity and liquidity of the XRP markets. For example, Ripple's 2017 external talking points said employees should talk about all the use cases for XRP that Ripple is supporting and how Ripple efforts are directed towards those use cases. A 2019 XRP Markets Report announced an initiative called XPring, which was launched to develop use cases for XRP. In April 2020, Ripple posted that it was looking to boost XRP liquidity through new use cases for XRP outside of cross-border payments. And in August 2020, Ripple told the public it was continuing to pursue liquid and robust markets for XRP by promoting other financial instruments such as derivatives tied to XRP. Ripple also hyped the quality of the team of experts it had hired to achieve these goals. As Schwartz put it, what really set XRP apart from any other digital asset, including Bitcoin and Ether, was the talented or amazing team of dedicated professionals that Ripple has to unmask the valid ecosystem around XRP. Ripple even encourages its employees to view XRP as an investment in Ripple and told them to buy, sell, trade, or recommend XRP if they had general confidence in Ripple team members and confidence in Ripple itself. Importantly, Ripple conveyed to investors that it was committed to these efforts and that there was no reasonable prospect, given Ripple's financial and reputational incentives, that it would abandon them. In February 2014, Larson publicly explained that our incentives are very well aligned, that for Ripple Labs to do well, we have to do a very good job in protecting the value of XRP and the value of the network, and urged inv investors to give us time to show that Ripple would add the most value to the protocol. Schwartz continued to cast efforts to increase XRP's price as Ripple's legal obligation and argued publicly that it would not be rational for Ripple to walk away from XRP given its financial incentives, while admitting it is the XRP market's expectations. Garlinghouse said in interviews variously that he believed the potential appreciation of XRP, that Ripple would continue to invest in the XRP ecosystem, and that Ripple was just getting started in its efforts. Defendants invited investors to speculate that Ripple's efforts could lead to an increase in XRP's price. Ripple also persistently stated that if it was successful in finding uses for XRP or the XRP ledger, there would be more demand for XRP. Ripple frequently explained XRP's value and or price would be tied to Ripple's efforts to increase demand. For example, in May 2014, Larson stated, if the protocol is successful, that digital asset will, most, will almost definitionally be successful. And for XRP, long-term primary use is something that enables the largest source of demand. Schwartz noted that if more people wanted to use XRP, then its price would go up, depending on Ripple's good steward stewardship, perhaps as high as $20 or $120 or higher. Schwartz also cast Ripple's sales of XRP as placing upward pressure on XRP's price because they would give Ripple a bigger war chest with which to make efforts for the asset. In April 2015, in response to XRP price declines, Ripple encouraged readers of an online XRP forum to think of the long-term prospects for XRP's price and link its value to the Ripple's efforts and success. In February 2017, Larson and Miguel Villas, another head of XRP Markets, encouraged an XRP investor to think of XRP's appreciation over the long term, including based on Ripple's entrepreneurial efforts. Villas noted on an investor forum that it was a foregone conclusion that if, if Ripple continues to focus on the work as to XRP, XRP's price would go up. 
Garlinghouse similarly stated during a Bloomberg interview that Ripple's digital assets, referring to XRP, would become more valuable if Ripple found more utility for it. In late 2020, Brian Madigan, Ripple's head of XRP markets, said that XRP could outperform other investments by 15% if it achieved 3% exposure to the trillions of dollars that XRP is solving for. Defendants often touted XRP price increases. Ripple often made celebratory public statements about XRP price increases. For example, in March 2017, Garlinghouse tweeted that XRP was at a two-year high and that next month the XRP was up nearly 500% to date. That same month, Ripple tweeted an article by Coindesk noting that Ripple's price surges to a four-month high. Monica Long, Ripple's chief marketer, informed Garlinghouse that the purpose of this tweet was to take advantage of the continued XRP increase and proposed reaching out to Ripple's exchange partners to speak publicly about the XRP rally. Garlinghouse responded that he loved the idea and then retweeted Ripple's promotion of the four-month high in a tweet uh, linked here. Ripple took other steps to amplify XRP price increases. In December 2017, Ripple's official company talking points prepared in light of XRP's price increase and resulting media attention instructed employees to say, XRP is up blank percent today. December 2017, Garlinghouse tweeted an article noting that Ripple soars at year end. That same month, Griffin emailed a potential XRP investor noting and tweeted about the dramatic price increases in XRP. Meanwhile, Monica Long instructed Ripple's public relations agency to make hay while the sun shines and to draft one, a tweet by an institutional XRP investor noting the rally, two, a tweet for Garlinghouse to announce that XRP would be listed on another trading platform, three, a press release noting the addition of a badass Ripple employee to Ripple's board, and for a customer announcement. Defendants used XRP's price as a proof of success of Ripple's efforts. In 2017, XRP's price increased from 0. 0.0064 to $2.30. Ripple took credit for this increase and tied it to the success of its managerial efforts. By this time, Garlinghouse had become the self-described face of Ripple and its most important spokesperson, appearing on major news networks like CNBC and CNN. Garlinghouse believed, as reflected by his internal talk to Ripple employees, that XRP's rise over the course of 2017 signals market expectations of Ripple and that this was due to the team Ripple had built. Garlinghouse spoke consistently with this belief. In April 2017, for example, Garlinghouse stated in an interview that increase in Ripple's price occurred because the market was finally recognizing Ripple's activities. And in March 2018, he reiterated Ripple's goal to develop a healthy ecosystem. And he noted, if we can continue to build the momentum of customer usage that continues to drive the velocity and demand for XRP, he felt very comfortable about the opportunity to grow the value of the XRP ecosystem, which is good for all participants in the XRP ecosystem. CNBC Garlinghouse interview, uh, where he states his belief that Ripple's efforts in promotion of a use case had increased the value of XRP. In emails to XRP investors and market participants too, Ripple pushed the concept that XRP's increasing price was proof of Ripple's success. Ripple made the point directly to XRP investors in emails, touting the price increase as proof of adoption of XRP and the XRP ledger, pitching the record-setting week reached by XRP and noting the strong correlation between the usefulness slash value of XRP and the adoption uses of Ripple's technology. 
Such communications also tied XRP's price increase to Ripple's efforts and noted that adoption of the technology in turn could drive the value around XRP and contribute to a rally in its price. Ripple made the same point in various XRP market reports, including explicit, explicitly tying stunning XRP price increases and impressive trading volumes increases to Ripple's own efforts to develop a use for XRP. XRP market reports also reflected the view that investors were connecting the dots between a 29,631% year-over-year price increase and the XRP escrow and Ripple's partnerships. This, re this report also touted the, the team of developers Ripple had and noted how the company had been a steward of XRP. VS publicly attributed the rally in XRP's price to Ripple, while Long and Gar Garlinghouse approved a quote for a working article wondering, what's driving Ripple's price to all-time highs? which explained Garlinghouse's view that Ripple's price, referencing XRP's price, was up because of a lot of the work we have done. Defendants target U.S.-based crypto platforms to list the XRP. Seeking to attract speculators and building liquidity for the XRP trading markets and to respond to sp specific <coughs> investor requests to make XRP more readily available for trading, Ripple offered crypto trading platforms incentives to list XRP. Vias led this exchange strategy, which Ripple explicitly stated believe could reach certain speculative trading volume targets. In 2017 alone, Ripple entered into six agreements with platforms and also offered two U.S.-based crypto trading platforms, 1 million and 5 million, respectively, to list XRP. Let me read that again. And also offered two U.S.-based crypto trading platforms, $1 million and $5 million, respectively, to list XRP. Ripple targeted one particular U.S.-based trading platform, Coinbase, for years to increase speculative trading volume in XRP, engaged in an online campaign to petition that platform to list XRP. Ripple noted internally that, quote, investors are interested in exchange listings because they want to see a price increase by getting XRP more exposed on major exchanges. Thus, Ripple touted XRP's availability on crypto trading platforms and noted it publicly when a new platform listed XRP or an existing platform increased XRP's availability. Defendants undertook efforts to influence the public's understanding about XRP and Ripple. Ripple touted the XRP market reports, which were aimed at reaching XRP speculators, as part of Ripple's efforts to promote a robust, successful market for XRP and attracting trading liquidity to XRP, the first XRP market report promised to provide regular updates on the state of the market, including commentary on price movement and announcement of exchanges. Certain market reports noted their purpose to increase transparency to the XRP market ecosystem. Through media talking points, the PR agency and even other XRP investors with whom Ripple's interests were aligned, defendants took other steps to combat what Ripple considered to be misinformation about XRP or Ripple or, in crypto parlance, FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. FUD. <laughs> Maybe it's Elmer FUD, I don't know. As Madigan put it, sentiments move markets and information about Ripple could shift the narrative in its favor. Moreover, Ripple noted that its employees must act transparently as to XRP transactions to avoid perceptions that could impair the integrity or reputation of the XRP market and prohibited its employees from trading XRP based on material non-public information, 
such as about XRP adoption or listing on crypto platforms, a prohibition long applied to securities. Ripple undertook and touted other steps to protect XRP market markets from excessive sales. <clears throat> Concern that large sales of XRP could cause XRP to lose liquidity or interest in XRP by speculators or to decrease in price from the outset of the XRP trading markets, Ripple took concrete public actions to minimize the market impact of its distributions of XRP, in addition to the founder lockups and escrow described above. For institutional sales, Ripple at times imposed lockups resale restrictions based on XRP trading volume to throttle, slow down resales. It also at times stopped selling XRP at discounted prices because the discounts had encouraged buyers to resell the XRP quickly at a profit. Ripple publicized these efforts as designed to prevent large subsequent resales and market and price instability. For program programmatic sales, Ripple's strategy was to sell what we could sell without impacting the market, which meant without impacting the price and volatility of the market. Ripple's XRP markets team regularly communicated with Ripple's market makers and with the ind individual defendants regarding programmatic sales and their potential impact on the broader market, including proposals for adjusting Ripple's sales strategy and recommendations for upcoming XRP sales. Ripple even provided specific instructions to market makers to stop sales or take other steps to protect XRP prices, including buying XRP. Ripple publicized these efforts, described their goal as minimizing market impact, and noted them as additional proof of Ripple's disciplined, responsible ownership of XRP. Defendant's marketing was successful. Reasonable participants viewed XRP as an investment. Defendant's efforts were successful. Institutional and retail investors and other sophisticated market participants routinely voiced their views that buying XRP was an investment in the XRP whose value would be driven by Ripple's efforts. In August 2014, one sophisticated investor told Larson it had bought XRP because the team is what we bet on and because we, the investor, believe in the team. Another investor called Ripple a central bank of XRP, which Ripple employees conveyed to individual defendants. Ripple received multiple inquiries about investing in XRP, with many explicitly calling it an investment in Ripple. In April 2018, one crypto reporter noted, just as Schwartz had above, that XRP was unlike Bitcoin or Ether. The reporter reasoned that for Bitcoin and Ether, the success isn't dependent upon any particular entity, whereas with XRP, its success depends on Ripple getting banks to use it. In May 2018, a blogger called XRP Hordor posted an article explaining why he thought speculators would soon prefer XRP because of the dedicated Ripple team, Ripple's track record, and Ripple's announcements of use cases for XRP. Garlinghouse forwarded the article and stated, Hodor is one of us! In 2019, Ripple discussed a potential engagement with a reputable investment bank to consider selling Ripple's equity to the public. Based on its expertise and the information Ripple provided, as well as public information and information about transactions in the securities of comparable companies, the bank prepared a presentation for Ripple. The bank's analysis explicitly tied Ripple's value to XRP's value and explained that any investment in Ripple assumed that Ripple had the financial incentive to continue to engage in efforts to increase XRP's price. That analysis was consistent with how Ripple's chief financial officer, Ron Will, at least on one other sophisticated valuation firm, viewed Ripple and XRP. The market at times treated the terms XRP and Ripple as synonymous, as Ripple itself did at times. Examples of Ripple talking about XRP as Ripple. 
Um, you have citations to that. XRP investors explaining Ripple-related reasons they invested in XRP. When in March 2018, Ripple tried to convince Business Insider to remove an article, uh, a statement that XRP is the only popular coin that is run by a company. Let me repeat that. When in March 2018, Ripple tried to convince Business Insider to remove from an article a statement that XRP is the only popular coin that is run by a company, the magazine rejected the request as it was absurd to dispute that XRP is run by a company. Ripple sold and distributed over 2.1 billion of XRP and the individual defendants sold 600 million into the public XRP markets they had created. Ripple succeeded in its goal of monetizing XRP to fund its business by selling directly or indirectly over 2 billion billion worth of XRP into the public XRP markets it had created. These sales became the lifeblood of and were existential for the company. Ripple's main business model slash source of income was XRP sales. From 2013 to 2020, Ripple's operating costs exceeded $2.1 billion. Let me repeat that. From 2013 through 2020, Ripple's operating costs exceeded $2.1 billion. Ripple raised $299 million by selling its stock and promissory notes and made just $21.9 million from selling software, let me repeat, and made just $21.9 million from selling software, none of which has anything to do with XRP. Ripple made up the difference by selling $1.5 billion in XRP and by distributing $609 million in XRP to conduits that then sold the XRP to the public to fund Ripple's venture of finding a use for XRP. Ripple sold over $1.5 billion of XRP to speculative investors. Targeting speculators, Ripple made over $750 million in programmatic sales of XRP. Between November 2014 and September 2019, Ripple sold $757 million of XRP in programmatic sales using the same market maker the individual defendants used, GSR, and then pooled the proceeds of those sales. Ripple's programmatic sales were made through blind bid-ask transactions. Ripple did not know the identity of the XRP purchasers on the other sides of these trades. Thus, Ripple did not and could not place any restrictions on the amounts of XRP the purchasers bought, their geographic location, or their resale plans. Nevertheless, Ripple understood that people were speculating on XRP as an investment as noted, Ripple explicitly targeted speculators and made increased speculative volume a target goal, and it was widely understood at Ripple that speculators were a key part of the XRP markets. Ripple's $750 million of institutional sales were dis distributions of XRP into public market using conduits. Between late 2013 and the end of 2020, Ripple sold another approximately 728.9 million of XRP in institutional sales. These sales were made by XRP2, Ripple's wholly owned subsidiary. Let me read that again. These sales were made by XRP2, Ripple's wholly owned subsidiary pursuant to written contracts that reflected an understanding that purchasers were sophisticated individuals or entities hoping to profit from XRP price movements, many through immediate, <coughs> excuse me, many through intermediate resales of XRP. In an application, XRP2 filed to register as many money services businesses with the state of New York Ripple stated that XRP2's customers were institutional and other accredited investors who are purchasing XRP for speculative purposes, such that XRP was not intended to be used as a currency. 
Many contracts required the purchaser to indemnify Ripple for any claims arising out of the purchaser's sale or distribution of XRP, including indicating the purchaser's resale intent, while others explicitly explain that the perfect purpose of acquiring XRP was to resell it. Ripple also priced some of the institutional sales at discounts from the then prevailing market price and thus created an economic incentive for purchasers to quickly resell the XRP as Ripple and Larson understood. For example, when pitching a large XRP sale to a buyer in July 2014, Larson noted that Ripple was selling large block purchases and viewed XRP as pretty undervalued and provided a report on XRP and Ripple that might be helpful from an investment perspective. Rappaport negotiated discount and lockup terms as part of an eventual institutional sale to a hedge fund. Ripple knew that many institutional sales buyers were acting as conduits and reselling XRP into public markets. Indeed, some institutional sales buyers were buying XRP as brokers, while others simply resold it as part of their trading strategies. For example, in 2015, Ripple sold over 700,000 of XRP to one entity who was reselling XRP, and Ripple paid it $100,000 as a commission. As another example, a U.S.-based purchaser acquired over 83 million of XRP from Ripple and immediately transferred it to a prearranged purchaser for a 2% fee. Larson and Garlinghouse reacted favorable to selling that much XRP to an investor. To an investor, Garlinghouse said, "Wow, nice," and Larson said, "That's good." And Ripple later observed an uptick in XRP trading volume surrounding this purchase, inferring that XRP was being resold into the market. Many of Ripple's institutional sales were governed by contracts with resale lockups that were disclaimed when the actual XRP was delivered. The contracts with actual sales restrictions limited a purchaser to selling XRP in amounts related to the trading volume of XRP, which helped Ripple control the speed at which resales occurred. In late 2018, years after its first institutional sale in 2013, Ripple launched a cross-border money transmission software called XRAPID, later known as ODL, On Demand Liquidity. ODL aimed aimed to facilitate converting U.S. dollars into a foreign fiat currency such as the Mexican peso by exchanging dollars for XRP and then using XRP to purchase a foreign currency. Ripple's ODL clients were money services businesses, not individuals, and they did not have to buy XRP from Ripple. They simply bought XRP in the open markets. Between May and December 2020, Ripple sold XRP to financial institutions in connection with ODL and transactions it called XRP-O or XRP origination, at times fashioning these sales as loans. Ripple treated these sales as other over-the-counter sales. This is because ODL customers were simply conduits for Ripple's distribution of XRP into public markets. They held XRP for mere seconds before selling it into the public markets. Sorry guys, I can't take live right now. I gotta keep keep rolling on this. Um, This is because ODL customers were simply conduits for Ripple's distributions of (laughs) XRP. Let's move on. ODL's customers resales of XRP in the market was so swift that Ripple took steps consistent with its commitment and strong financial incentive to support the XRP markets. Let me skip through that. Guys, I'll just bear in mind, tomorrow I'm going to be doing, tomorrow, hopefully if I have time, if not, it's going to be Monday or or, uh, Tuesday, but um, I'm going to be doing the other side of the coin. This would be the defendant's motion for summary judgment. So um, if you're saying, well, he's reading it in a funny way, I'll read it. I read it that way. I'm just trying to bring some life into it, okay? Um, 
Ripple distributed $609 million in XRP through other conduits, including using XRP as executive compensation. In addition to selling XRP for dollars and then deploying them, Ripple funded its projects by transferring XRP to third parties and then having them sell the XRP into public markets. Once more, furthering Ripple's twin goals of deploying XRP sales proceeds to fund its projects and distributing XRP into the public markets. Through the end of 2020, Ripple realized $609 million from these types of distributions. These distributions included millions of units of XRP as executive compensation. They also included distributing 776 million units of XRP as part of the so-called XPring initiative launched in 2018 to fund third parties that would pursue other uses for XRP. Let me read that again. They also included distributing 776 million units of XRP as part of the so-called XPring initiative launched in 2018 to fund third parties that would pursue other uses for XRP. Ripple touted the amount of money in U.S. dollars, not XRP, that it had invested to boost XRP. Ripple understood that these partner companies would sell the XRP into public markets in order to monetize it immediately. Ripple also took and publicized steps to manage the pace at which XPring partners sold XRP into the market in order to control the effects of these sales on XRP's price and liquidity. An April 2020 internal presentation about XRP supply showed Ripple treated all of these XRP distributions as functionally identical in that they all impacted circulating supply. Larson and Garlinghouse sold over 600 million of XRP into the markets. Larson offered and sold XRP from at least 2013 through 2020, having received 9 billion units of XRP upon Ripple's founding. Larson began his own sales in 2013 and continued selling XRP into public markets through 2020, making approximately 450 million from his sales. Larson sold XRP even after learning of the SEC's investigation. Garlinghouse sold XRP for $150 million in proceeds. He continued to sell XRP through the end of 2020 after he was named in a private lawsuit, accusing him and Ripple of unregistered XRP sales, and after SEC staff informed him, the staff was likely to conclude that Ripple's offers and sales of XRPs or security transactions. That's interesting. Let's read that one more time. He continued, this is Garlinghouse, continued to sell XRP through the end of 2020 after he was named in a private lawsuit, accusing him and Ripple of unregistered XRP sales. And after SEC staff informed him, the staff was likely to conclude that Ripple's offers and sales of XRP, XRP were securities transactions. His XRP sales have been his largest source of income. Defendants did not register their offers and sales of XRP or provide investors with relevant information. Ripple has promoted itself as the most transparent company in the crypto space, partly because Ripple purports to provide some information about its XRP sales and efforts as to XRP. Indeed, Ripple has argued that the existence of an identifiable actor, Ripple, to provide information about a digital asset, XRP, distinguishes XRP from assets such as Bitcoin and Ether. But defendants have never filed a registration statement as to their offers and sales of XRP, nor has Ripple ever filed or made public the type of information otherwise required by the federal securities laws, such as audited financial statements as to Ripple or XRP. Defendants claim Ripple has no obligation to provide full and accurate information to XRP investors because it is a private company that takes significant measures to safeguard the confidentiality of its financial condition. As a result, Ripple has provided incomplete information about its distributions of XRP into the market and its heavy subsidies of its ODL customers, 
For example, the XRP market reports that Ripple provides to investors on its website do not disclose all of Ripple's XRP distributions and are thus not a good representation of the XRP that was introduced into the market. Indeed, Ripple has expressed concerns about the deleterious effect if the market understood Ripple's distributions of almost 200 million units of XRP in a single week. I'll read that again. Indeed, Ripple has expressed concerns about the deleterious effects if the market understood Ripple's distributions of almost 200 million units of XRP in a single week. Defendants were repeatedly warned that their offers and sales of XRP could be deemed securities transactions. Ripple received legal guidance that XRP could be a security. As described above in February and October 2012, Ripple and its founders, including Larson, received two legal memos from Perkins Coey. Analyze XRP's legal risks, including potential offers and sales under Howey. That's the Howey test. In February 2015, Ripple received another memorandum, this one from the Paul Hastings law firm, analyzing whether XRP falls under the definition of security under Howey and is therefore subject to regulation by federal and state agencies. The Paul Hastings memo concluded that XRP likely should not be treated as a security if Ripple did not pursue the entrepreneurial and managerial activities it had taken and would continue to take. But the Paul Hastings memo also noted that XRP presents more risk of being deemed a security than other virtual currencies by virtue of the close relationship between Ripple Labs and XRP. The memo also advised that Ripple would face an uphill argument if it sought to establish that XRP is exempt from the security laws on the grounds that it is a currency. Paul Hastings further advised, the relationship between XRP and Ripple Labs distinguishes XRP from certain or other virtual currencies. Bitcoin, for example, does not have a single identifiable promoter. Frontline Lisi, hey. Hey, hey. How are you? Can I get a refill while I you're there? I was just coming to get your refill. Oh, she's the best. Frontline Lisi, everyone. Um, uh, the Paul Hastings memo further advice, in order to help mitigate the risk of XRP de- being deemed a security, Ripple Labs should be extremely careful in promoting and selling XRP. Regulators will look to Ripple Labs public documents and documents provided to potential purchasers of XRP in applying the Howey test. As such, statements touting XRP as an investment opportunity and the potential profits that buyers may derive from XRP's appreciation and value would tend to support the argument that XRP functions as a security. In March 2015, when Ripple was contemplating the launch of an XRP investment fund for accredited investors, the investment fund's draft prospectus cited various risk factors relating to the possibility that XRP was a security. Ripple's compliance and regulatory personnel understood that XRP could consider, uh, SEC could consider XRP to be a security. In October 2016, Ripple's chief compliance officer, Antonetto Gorman, advised Garlinghouse that despite FinCEN's designation of XRP as a cryptocurrency for purposes of FinCEN regulations, the SEC may well come out on the side that certain cryptocurrencies are securities. O'Gorman emailed Garlinghouse, XRP certainly has some securities types characteristics. In approximately 2017, April, O'Gorman and Ripple's general counsel gave a presentation to various Ripple teams reviewing how XRP could be evaluated under Howey. And shortly thereafter, the SEC issued the Dow report. O'Gorman discussed it with both Larson and Garlinghouse. O'Gorman also discussed it with Garlinghouse, discussed with Garlinghouse that there was a risk. XRP could be deemed a security, including based on guidance from the SEC. Likewise, Ripple's Director of Regulatory Regula- Regula- uh, 
No more time. Likewise, Ripple's Director of Regulatory Relations, Ryan Zagoni, was aware that SEC could consider XRP to be a security and subject to its jurisdiction. As Perkins Coey had advised in October 2012, Zagone understood that companies can request a no-action letter from the SEC, a letter in which the SEC staff explained that they will not recommend an enforcement action against someone based on a particular conduct. As the SEC's expert explained in unrebutted testimony, the no-action letter process is routine and a common practice for market participants to gain an understanding of whether their proposed activities comply with the federal security laws, including whether offers and sales of an instrument involves an investment contract. Ripple's legal department was responsible for its compliance with the U.S. securities laws. Ripple has claimed the attorney-client privilege over what Ripple's attorneys advised about its security law exposure. But a non-privileged document Ripple's general counsel sent to the PR agency shows Ripple knew that XRP could be considered an a-, a security and that Howie would govern the analysis. In December 2017, Ripple's general counsel sent the PR agency our internal draft message regarding how to talk about XRP. The document was titled, How We Talk About XRP. It stated that if XRP was a security, it could lead to lots of headaches and that our laws require securities to be registered and that how we talk about a digital asset can make a difference in terms of determining whether it was a security or not. The document also contained a handy cheat sheet for publicly disclosing XRP. In other words, there's a little chart here. So instead of this, you say this, okay? Instead of Ripple's XRP, you say XRP or a digital, digital asset native to the XRP ledger. Instead of saying, we are working hard to increase the price of XRP, you should say, we are working hard to create compelling uses for XRP, a unique digital asset. Instead of saying XRP is a strong long-term investment, say XRP is a unique and valuable digital asset. Instead of saying trading in Ripple, say trading in XRP. Instead of saying we're up blank percent today, say XRP is up blank percent today. In March 2018, Garlinghouse delivered a speech acknowledging there isn't regulatory uncertainty. Regulatory uncertainty means that I disagree with the regulatory uncertainty, so I'm going to call it regulatory uncertainty. In the same vein, on March 8th, 2018, he tweeted, in context of yesterday's SEC statements, I hear some in crypto talk about the current regulatory uncertainty. What's uncertain? SEC statements have been consistent and clear. Regulatory uncertainty is just a euphemism for we wish we could ignore SEC regulations. By May 2018, Ripple had advised its employees that it was up to the SEC to decide whether XRP was a security. Similarly, a member of Ripple's communication team asked Ripple personnel to study a document called Key Messages, FAQ, and Fast Facts to provide guidance on how to discuss the securities classification issue. The Key Messages, FAQ, and Fast Facts Fast Facts contained a section called SCC slash security conversation in which Ripple noted, ultimately, this will be up to the SEC to decide. That month, certain U.S. investors who had purchased XRP sued Ripple and Garlinghouse in a lawsuit that remains pending and alleged that they had improperly failed to register their offers and sales of XRP in violation of Section 5. This is Coffee versus Ripple Labs. Um, I believe there's a, a Toomey case as well. There may be others. Um, the SEC's investigation and confirmed to defendants that their XRP distributions could violate the federal security laws. In April 2018, the SEC's Division of Enforcement sent Ripple's attorneys a letter referencing an inquiry into Ripple and requesting that Ripple preserve documents, including those relating to Ripple's offers and sales of XRP and any analysis by Ripple regarding the application of the U.S. securities laws to offers and sales of XRP. Ripple had retained as counsel Andrew Cerisny, who had served as SEC's Director of Enforcement from 2014 to 2016. 
Uh, interesting, let's read that again. By May 8, 2018, Ripple had retained as counsel Andrew Sarasny, who had served as the SEC's Director of Enforcement from 2014 to 2016. Ripple was aware enforcement could ultimately recommend to the SEC, that is the commissioners, that it take enforcement action against Ripple. Ripple, where'd I go? <laughs> Ripple representatives, including Cersney and Garlinghouse, participated in multiple meetings with Bill Hinman, the SEC, then Director of Corporation Finance and Enforcement Staff, in connection with the investigation. During one meeting in September 2019, Hinman advised Cersney to become compliant with the security laws. Ripple should stop offering XRP or register those offerings, as Garlinghouse admits. Realizing the SEC could determine Ripple violated the securities laws, Ripple undertook a lobbying campaign to influence the SEC's decision. In the months after it learned of enforcement in, enforcement's investigation, the PR agency advised Ripple that lawmakers were preparing to, preparing to crack down on cryptocurrencies. Ripple began actively campaigning to convince government officials that XRP should not be considered a security and by, by July 2018 had retained lobbying firms. In late 2018 and early 2019, Garlinghouse made multiple visits to Washington, D.C. to try to influence members of Congress, the, the prior administration, and the SEC commissioners. In these meetings, no one from the SEC ever said the SEC did not view Ripple or Garlinghouse's offers and sales of XRPs as security transactions. And during this period, defendants were aware that the SEC's investigation was continuing. As a result, Ripple understood that SEC could still ultimately decide that it considered XRP offerings to be security offerings. All right, I think we're getting close to being done here. My wife's going, please. <laughs> Larson and Garlinghouse, after becoming... Hey, guys, thank you for joining me today on a Sunday. And um, I'm going to be watching some Aaron Judge later, um, New York Yankees. But yeah, well, he's on in a couple hours. And anyway, so wanted to get this in before then. I had a lot of people, a lot of friends, a lot of people talking about XRP. Um, I think... Most people don't know like all the ins and outs. So I'm presenting this motion for summary judgment by the SEC today. I'll be providing defendants or ripples in their um, executives version tomorrow or, or Tuesday. So stay tuned. You're going to hear the other side of the coin. Then you can decide, you know, then you can make your decision. What do you think is going to happen? Um, Larson and Garlinghouse, after becoming CEO, each directed Ripple's offers and sales of XRP and orchestrated, carried out, and oversaw implementation of Ripple's plan to distribute XRP widely, including their own offers and sales of XRP. As described below, Larson, as executive chairman, had the ability to cause Ripple to file a registration statement for its offers and sales of XRP, and both he and Garlinghouse knew that Ripple never filed a registration statement. Larson knew, or at least recklessly disregarded, the facts that made Ripple's offers and sales of XRP unregistered securities transactions and substantially assisted Ripple's violations. Thank you for the likes, guys, and thank you for the rose. I appreciate that. I don't get a lot of roses. I really appreciate that. Um, Larson knew or at least recklessly disregarded that XRP was being offered and sold as part of a common enterprise with Ripple. Larson knew that XRP sales proceeds were used to fund Ripple's operations and that the vast majority of Ripple's cash flow and funding came from XRP. Thank you again, you guys. Thank you. Larson also knew that XRP was being offered and sold as an investment in Ripple's efforts. And as a large XRP holder himself, Larson's own incentives were aligned with Ripple's and with other XRP investors. As Larson noted in August 2020, with respect to an increase in the price of XRP, gotta love those rallies. 
Larson knew and recklessly disregarded that XRP was being offered and sold as an investment in Ripple's efforts. Larson was aware that investors were buying XRP because he pitched XRP to them as an investment and because they told him so. Larson admits he hoped and believed that early XRP buyers were purchasing XRP for long-term speculation purposes. He told one investor, the most volume in the most volume in the space is speculation. Indeed, Larson knew that some investors viewed XRP as an investment in Ripple or as a large XRP investor noted because they bet on the team. Larson also specifically explained his belief that Ripple's efforts could increase XRP's price. In a February 2014 interview, Larson explained that one of Ripple's key roles is making sure that we distribute XRP in a way that adds as much utility and as liquidity as we possibly can, that our incentives are very well aligned, and that for Ripple Labs to do well, it had to do a very good job in protecting the value of XRP. When he sold his XRP, Larson, like Ripple, took no steps to identify who in particular was buying the XRP or what the pur purchaser intended to do with it. Larson, like Ripple, never restricted his sales of XRP to purchasers who would have a use for XRP, and Larson, like Ripple, never took any steps to restrict U.S.-based purchasers from buying the XRP he was selling including on non-US-based crypto trading platforms. Larson understood that XRP could be considered a security. Larson knew as early as 12, uh, 2012 that XRP could be classified as a security. He reviewed the legal memos and understood that, XR, that the XRP he received was compensation for personally assuming the risk of XRP being deemed a security. Moreover, Larson participated in Ripple's efforts to market XRP as an investment. Moreover, Larson, I just said that, um, even though he knew Ripple's promotion of XRP as an investment was relevant to the question of whether or not XRP was deemed a security. Larson substantially assisted with Ripple's violations, C as CEO Larson was aware of, he participated in or approved Ripple's one, sales of XRP, two, efforts to create XRP markets, three, efforts to get XRP listed on crypto trading platforms, four, use of XRP as incentive compensation, five, efforts to stop the price of XRP from decreasing, six, efforts to protect XRP's liquidity and price by imposing resale instructions. At least as executive chairman, Larson could have caused Ripple to file a registration statement. Moreover, Larson's personal sales of XRP assisted with Ripple's distribution and the creation of a market for XRP. VC Larson described his XRP sales as a part of a plan to reduce the market's fears associated with Ripple's founders' large XRP holdings. Let's read that one again. Moreover, Larson's personal sales of XRP assisted with Ripple's distribution and the creation of a market for XRP. Larson described his XRP sales as part of a plan to reduce the market fears associated with Ripple's founders' large XRP holdings. Um, I, don't, I don't need any luck. I'm, I don't care which side, which side wins. I don't need any luck. <laughs> Larson thus timed his sales to minimize the impact on the XRP market. And Larson encouraged at least one marketing firm to feed positive news stories about XRP to the market. Apple's finance app hasn't updated an XRP story in 25 weeks. Seems like a big opening for the marketing firm to feed XRP news. Larson engaged in most of these acts from within the United States. He managed most of his sales through an account with the U.S. based Bitstamp USA. Bitst, bits, Bitstamp, yeah. Received sales proceeds back in U.S. dollars from that account and withdrew them in his U.S. based accounts. So then they go on, um, Garlinghouse, new or recklessly new. Um, so they go on and on about that. Let me see if there's much else. So it kind of repeats 
a lot of the allegations. You know, guys, I think I'm going to stop right there. That's a lot of info. Um, it goes into some of the law on what an investment contract is, but I think you get the major gist of it. Um, this is the SEC side. Again, I'm not taking any sides. You know, whatever happens, happens. The law will be the law. Whatever the law is, we will, we will soon find out. This is a legal case in dispute. Um, and um, I will, I want to appreciate, I want to thank you guys for watching on a Sunday. Um, again, I'm going to do the motion for summary judgment by defendant. So you get to hear the other side of the story. So you don't have to panic. Like, oh my God, he's reading, reading one side and not the other. I'll read the other tomorrow. I had to pick one before the other as I chose the first one that popped up. So that is, you guys get it. You guys get it. I'm not going to comment. I'm not going to give my own thoughts. You have it there. I read it. Read your own thoughts, but make sure you come back. Hey, you're welcome, Cameron Mayhew. Thank you. I really appreciate that. If you gave me that sombrero, sombrero hat, I would really go crazy right now, but thank you very much. So, um, but yeah, that's it. I got to run you guys. I appreciate again your time and uh, I'm going to try to post this. I'm going to try to post this in a couple other areas so you guys have it, but hey, have a great day. Happy Sunday. Sunday fun day. Seize the day. Carpe diem. Attorney Steve out. Not the general legal information, not legal advice, not financial advice. And you can figure out the rest. Bye-bye.